Welcome, everyone. My name is Achit, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Dr. David Wong is our speaker, and he'll be giving us an insightful look at advanced bone grafting techniques and procedures and how comb beam computed tomography, CBCT, aids in the overall treatment planning process. If at any point you have a question, please type it into the box labeled have a question, and we will conduct a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. To talk with other attendees, navigate to your control panel at the bottom of your screen and click the chat icon. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Wong, welcome. Welcome to part two of the No Nonsense Guide to Bone Grafting. Um, this is a continuation of, of our CBCT in Action series. Today, we're focusing all on guided bone regeneration. I know we're going to have tons of questions, so we've, we've actually set up quite a few little, uh, little educational opportunities and events where we can you know, continue to communicate, educate you guys about this stuff. So uh, today... We only have an hour, so we're gonna. I'm gonna try to co go about 45, 50 minutes. That way, we can answer the questions, and then you know, if we need to keep going, we'll we'll go over to Instagram or something and, and talk. But um, anyway, if you guys ever do have any questions about GBR or anything uh, about cases or whatever, give me a buzz. My uh, my uh, Instagram handle is david.long.dds, and my surgical handle is going to be. Uh, Plaque China. So most of you guys know that already. Real quick, if you guys know there are some of you all who are just kind of casual listeners and just want to sit and listen and learn, that's great. Some of you guys want to get into it a little bit more. If you do want to get into it a little bit more, do some hands-on live surgery and all that stuff. Uh, you, you guys probably know this. Dr. Curry Levin and I, two times a year, we do a, we do a course out of his uh, Red Rock Institute in Las Vegas. It's a great setting. Uh, we we take good care of you. Uh, two whole days of nothing but but uh, socket grafting and GBR and some soft tissue grafting and PRF and all that stuff. Well, let's get started while we're here today. So with CBCT in action and GBR, we're going to handle a, a very specific thing today. We're really going to be talking about mostly single teeth, uh, dental implants, and bone grafting cases. So when I think of GBR and, and anterior aesthetics, for whatever reason, this this woman comes to my mind. So how would you help this person? She's missing tooth number eight. Or is she? She's wearing a flipper. This is what she looks like when she smiles without her flipper. And this is what she looks like when you lift her lip up. So as you can see, she, she is missing number eight, but she does have an implant uh, that's been malpositioned way up in the, uh, you know, what pretty high and pretty, pretty far uh, forward. Um, of course, she's got Invisalign on, on the bottom for whatever reason. So uh, we've got some, some things going on here. And my question always is, is when we're teaching is, is, how do you help these types of people? And, and the answer a lot of times, unfortunately, is we can't. You know, the best thing I can do at this point is sit on my end of the computer and really educate people um, to avoid these types of situations. Because trust me, when these things walk into your office, there really is no no good way out that that ends well for, for anybody. But it's not just that lady. I mean, we see these things all the time. As a periodontist, um, this, this walks in my office several times a day. Um, so we, we see a lot of these exposed implant components, uh, malpositioned implants. Maybe they were done with a guide. Maybe they were done freehand. I don't even know. But my, my assumption is, at the very least, we probably weren't looking at 3D uh, uh, 3D imaging and, and making the proper you know, surgical plan to, to make sure that, that we uh, ensure success with these patients. So where are we at with dental implants today? You know, it's pretty rare nowadays that we, that we are worried about an implant osseo integrating. Nowadays, we're more concerned with implant aesthetics and making sure that we get a nice outcome for the patient. Because you guys have probably heard me say this before, patients don't come to us asking us for implants they come to us asking for teeth, right? They say, I want this tooth replaced. They don't tell you that they want an implant. So to review what we talked about last time, um, we, talked to, we talked about uh, the rationale for socket grafting, why it's important to be able to preserve the dimensions of the ridge so that we can uh, place a future implant or even do a, a nice looking uh, fixed bridge if that's what we're still doing. 
Uh, we talked about the three different types of sockets and the various techniques for grafting, with the exception of what we're talking about today, which is GBR. We talked about the principles of bone grafting. We talked about the, uh, the rule of the four S's. So I'll review that for you too, if you, if you guys weren't at the last one. We talked about how to choose a bone graft material and how to determine when a membrane is required and when it is not. Uh, we provided uh, just a brief, brief, brief introduction into guided bone regeneration or GBR. Now, we've really accomplished the first four things. Today, we're gonna dive deeper into you know, the membrane part of it because I know a lot of you all will, will message me on Instagram and sometimes you'll reference somebody else's post and you'll say, how did, how did you tie that membrane in or how do you do that? So the bonus today is going to be a video on how to tie in and secure the membrane over the bone graft site. But you're going to have to stay to the end uh, to see that. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about flap um, incision design and flap reflection and suturing and all that stuff. Um, we're going to talk about the limitations of GBR as well. Uh, we'll talk about barrier uh, membrane selection. As you all know, I keep my bone grafts and my membranes very, very simple. That way it's, it's uh, simple for my staff and my team uh, to keep track of inventory very easily. And I also don't want a lot of overhead for me. I want to be able to simplify my processes when it comes to, to uh, bone grafting surgery. We'll talk a little bit about soft tissue considerations. Uh, we won't get into soft tissue grafting just yet, but if you guys are interested in that, when you guys are done with this webinar, uh, give the guys over there at Henry Shine some feedback and, and we'll come back and do plenty of webinars for you. But long story short, when it comes to extracting a tooth, we know that you lose bone, okay? We know that you lose a ton of bone, even more, more bone uh, than with periodontal disease. So when you have a tooth extracted, you're going to get 40 to 60% of the bone uh, shrinkage or atrophy. Uh, within the first two to three years, and then that resorption rate continues throughout the patient's life at a rate of about one half to one percent. So, nothing you can do about it. It's the rare exception where you take out a tooth and no bone loss occurs. Uh, more often than not, the patient loses at least bone volume, if not also bone density. So, clinically, it'll look something like this you get a lateral incisor extracted, you get that labial concavity. I'm sure several of you all can, can relate to that in, in your practice. Uh, once again, this is a very common thing that we see whenever we just take out teeth without regard for any socket grafting or any type of a rich preservation graft. The reason that I always teach socket grafting so much, and we do a ton of that um, in all our courses, all our webinars, all my seminars for Shine, uh, BioHorizons, uh, Dense Plasterone, any of those, any of those come, uh, do webinars for, we're always talking about socket grafting. It's probably the most uh, popular topic that I speak on. But the reason it's most, they're so predictable is because sockets are acute wounds. So they're bleeding. You take out a tooth, it's bleeding like crazy. It's got a periodontal ligament in there. A lot of times it's a four wall defect, which is the most predictable type of a bone grafting situation. Um, so with all those factors, especially the fact that it's an acute wound and you have periodontal ligament cells in there, you're going to be successful crafting the socket as long as you choose the right material. And the right material that we talked about was mineralized cortical bone or at least cortical cancellous bone, okay, something like that. We had a case today where the doc put in hydroxyapatite and we went in there today it looked good radiographically. It looked good on the CBCT. We get in there, and it's just all um, just a bunch of you know particles that aren't even integrated. Not it wasn't real bone. So we always teach putting in an allograft human bone graft material, and I always recommend either cortical, like you see here on this package, or cortical cancellous bone. Those are the only two choices in my eyes as far as socket grafting goes. Um, Lots of people do different things. Those are the two predictable options that are also going to be the least expensive for you. But when we talk about basic socket grafts versus complex socket grafts, remember from the first webinar, the key to diagnosing what kind of a socket you have, you need a perio probe. And with the perio probe, 
what you're going to do is put it inside the socket walls and count how many walls of bone that you have. Ideally, you're going to have four walls of bone, the facial, lingual, mesial, and distal walls. If you don't have that, um, then we have to go to using a membrane. If you do have four intact walls of bone, then it's just basic socket grafts. Okay, you just grab your mineralized cortical bone. I use BioHorizons. You just pack it into the socket gently. You know, put maybe a little piece of collar tape or hella tape over the top of it. Put in a suture, and you're done. Okay. The difference is going to be is when you have one of these top four situations when basic socket grafting does not work. Okay. Situation number one, which is what we're going to be talking about today, is when you take out a tooth or teeth and you have a blown out facial plate. There's no, there's no bone on the facial plate. You handle that differently than, than a basic socket graft. Situation number two is, is if, a, if a tooth has severe bone loss around it, whether it's from an injury or from periodontal disease, you have no bone, so you don't have any bone to preserve. So there's no, you know, there's no ridge preservation happening here. So in that situation, you have to do GBR or a similar type of, of a bone graft uh, technique. The third situation is when you have a, an abscess. So if you have a fistulous tract coming from the facial like this, you don't even need to take a CBCT. You know for sure there's no bone on the facial plate and that you're going to have to use a membrane. The fourth situation is going to be when you don't have enough bone to begin with. So this happens quite a bit whenever a, you, you have um, a wide tooth like this upper canine or a lower incisor where the bone is notoriously thin. So sometimes the, the tooth itself, buccal lingually or labiolingually, is wider than the alveolus that it sits in. So you can take this tooth out as an example right here, wrap the socket all you want to, you're still not going to have enough bone. That's why you're going to, that's why CBCTs are so important. We can take these 3D images and understand that this is not a socket graph. If we if we preserve the ridges, it's still going to be too thin. We would have to augment this site at the time of the extraction. Same thing here with the, with the lower incisor. See how it's wider buccal lingually than it is um, than, than the actual uh, alveolar process. So when we talk about guided bone regeneration (GBR), the key thing here, what you should be immediately thinking about is membrane. I got to use a membrane. Okay. Anytime you say guided anything, guided tissue regeneration, guided bone regeneration, we're always talking about needing a barrier membrane. So right then and there, that's the big difference between a ridge preservation and a ridge augmentation. A ridge preservation is your socket graft where you're just trying to preserve what you have. If you like what you have, you're trying to, to keep it from getting any skinnier. A ridge augmentation is different. You don't like what you already have. You're trying to make it wider, okay? So that's the difference between a ridge preservation and a ridge augmentation. Now, there are two different things, and they're also, the technique is way different, and the predictability is also way different. And the reason that is is because one is generally an acute wound. The other one is generally a chronic wound, okay? So acute wounds would be like your extraction site where you have four intact walls of bone. That type of an acute wound heals brilliantly. Whereas a, a tooth that's been missing for several years, that would be a chronic wound or a chronic defect. That doesn't heal as well when you're just using, you know, uh, powdered bottles of bone like this. Okay. So if you look at a radiograph, if you're going to augment the number eight site, that's a, ridge augmentation or a GBR, number nine is going to be extracted. That's going to be your acute one. So I would expect between the two the two sites, I would expect uh, the socket graft of number nine to heal better than my ridge augmentation of number eight if we were talking about separate procedures. The reason this that is, let's explore that a little bit more. We're going to introduce the concept of the bone race. The bone race is basically Understanding that the at the finish line is the bony defect, and at the starting line are going to be various cells that are racing to that finish line, and whatever type of cell reaches that defect first 
is what you're going to get. So let's talk about that a little bit more. The racers in the bone race are going to be your bacterial cells, your gingival cells, periodontal ligament cells, and bone cells. So they all have their unique advantages and disadvantages on why or how they can win the race and what what and why they can't win the race. So let's go down just with step by step here. So when it comes to bacteria, you know, bacteria are the ultimate bad guys that prevent us from growing bone. And the reason that is, is because they kill the bone use, utilizing a host immune response. So through a, a series of interactions between the bacteria and the host cells, you end up losing a ton of bone. Um, there's not a whole lot we can do with that when that bacteria is related to a hopeless tooth, like non-restorable caries, a root fracture, or periodontal disease. In those situations, as much as we try to treat these, these things with endo or periodontal surgery or splinting or whatever, it just doesn't work because we have bacteria around the tooth that's causing, you know, uh, uh, causing bone loss. Over time, these, in, these infections become chronic and the bad thing is, is that patients may not even feel anything. They'll walk around with perio disease or a, or, a, or a broken or a fractured root and not even know it sometimes. But the only way that we can defeat bacteria for our situation that we're talking about today with GBR is by taking out the tooth, degranulating the site, and on occasion putting the patient on, on antibiotics. So this is a prime example where you have hopeless number 29 and 30. We just take these teeth out. You know, we we have we we can't just we can, we can't just redo the endo and you know do osseous surgery and bone grafting around these teeth. It's just not going to work. We have too much bacteria uh, involved in, in, in this disease process. So, bacteria, bad guys. We got to get get rid of them. PDL cells. You know, these are the cells that we want in our sockets. Whether it's a blown out socket or an intact socket, we want these guys in there because they are capable of regeneration. Matter of fact, these cells are so powerful. It's the sole reason why for many, many years, dentists and surgeons were so reluctant to graft sockets. You would hear things like, we take teeth out all the time and the bone just heals by itself. The reason it used to heal by itself, or the reason it does heal by itself is because of these periodontal ligament cells that are capable of regeneration. If you've ever aggressively even scaled and root planed a patient, you'll notice that sometimes non-surgically you can get defect fill around a tooth. And once again, that 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 is without a bone graft or anything like that. That power of regeneration comes from PDL cells. Now, the good thing about PDL cells is they're already in the socket. So there are they already have a head start, they have a very you know positive geographic advantage that helps them win the bone race especially when there's four walls of bone. It's terrible, though, whenever you have chronic disease, you know, where you have periodontal disease where the, the defect fully circumscribes the entire root of the, of the tooth. That's a different story. You, have some, you, don't, you don't have so many PDL cells in that situation. Bone cells are the ultimate good guys, uh, as long with their partners, the PDL cells. The problem with bone cells is that they're extremely, extremely slow, especially when you compare them to you know, bacteria and, and fibroblasts or gingival cells. They're also the most osteogenic. So if they, we can at least get them to win the race, they will grow bone, but they're slow. So that's going to be a problem for us as we uh, go further into this discussion. They also are technique sensitive because they need a blood vessel for transportation. So if there's no blood, you're not going to get any bone either. And bone cell, bone growth is also like growing money and investing. The more bone you have, the more bone you can grow. Of course, if you needed bone, then why, you know, why do you need to grow it? Or if you have bone, why do you need to grow it? So that, that's an issue. The technique sensitivity comes when we talk about the four S's of bone graft. Remember, if you're going to grow bone, you have to have a clean surface, your bone graft has to be stable. You have to maintain the space and you have to know how to suture. Those are the four S's. If you can't do those four things, you know, then you're in trouble when it comes to growing bone. So bone cells, the ultimate good guys, have to win the race. 
but it's really hard for them to do that if they're so slow. And also if we can't do our technique right with the four S's, stabilizing, space maintaining, cleaning the surface and suturing. <clears throat> Lastly, of all the racers, these guys usually win. Unless we intervene as dentists, gingival cells will win this race because they are the fastest of all the cells. They are fast. They are, they are I, compared to a bone cell, I believe the data is showing that they're 10 times faster than a bone cell. Don't quote me on that, but they are incredibly fast relative to bone cells. They are the easiest for undifferentiated cells to transform into tissue. So the default, um, the, the def the, the default cellular type for undifferentiated cells is going to be a fibroblast, which is going to essentially a gingival cell, just going to heal in by scar tissue or repair. There are no rules for gingival cells. You don't have to worry about, you know, cleaning uh, the, the root surface or cleaning the side, the grain laying the socket. It doesn't really matter what you do. You can break a tooth off in there. It doesn't matter. The gingival cells will take over and you'll, you'll cover that area um, with, with granulation tissue, which will then turn into just soft tissue. So if these guys are the fastest and the least technique sensitive, how do we prevent these gingival cells from winning so that the bone cells can win? And we do that by the concept of GBR, guided bone regeneration. But I'm going to also introduce to you guys the concept of barrier by bulk. And I'm going to have to walk you through that so we're not just going to explain it. Cases like this, where we have a traumatic, you know, forceful, you know, breakage of the labial plate taking out a canine, if we don't graft that socket or the defect and manage our soft tissue properly, it will indeed heal by repair, right? You get a lot of soft tissue into that socket because the gingival cells win the race. When we see, when we're looking at cases before we take out the teeth, yeah, if you look Look at the canine on your left versus the lateral one. The size are on the right. Hopefully, we can recognize that the canine on the left is the more difficult case, right? It's the tooth is sitting outside the bone. That tooth out and just let it heal. Soft tissue is just going to go in there. Whereas, if we take out this lateral incisor, there's a good chance you know the PDO cells uh, will grow bone with or without our assistance. So the winning formula is we have to get bone to infiltrate the socket first before the soft tissue does. And how we do that is going to be by the concept of guided bone regeneration. I'm going to walk you through this case right now. So here we have a case, tooth number seven. It's undergoing pathologic migration, which is why the patient is experiencing a gap between her teeth that was not there before. If you look really closely at the middle of the tooth, it's slightly pink. It's going it's undergoing uh, internal root resorption. And then, of course, you see the big you know, periodontal abscess. Radiographically, we have decent interproximal height of bone, which is really important if we're going to re, uh, restore or uh, preserve the interdental papilla. But this is the condition of the tooth, so it's got to come out. So the first lesson that we're going to have is that anytime you see a fistulous tract on the facial aspect, you are going to have missing labial bone 100% of the time. We don't have too many 100% things in dentistry, but this is one of them. So when we manage buccal uh, blown out facial plates, the thing that we have to recognize is that we're also in the aesthetic zone. So we have to grow bone without destroying the aesthetics. So how we do that is, so with our incisions here, you're going to notice that we don't include the papilla in the incision design or the flat design. So they're called papilla sparing incisions. So we're going to take out that little supernumerary uh, tooth thing that, that was at the apex of the root. And then we're, here's our defect. We have to degranulate it. Got to clean out the uh, clean out the socket. Remember, you have to have a clean surface. But you'll also notice at the apex, we put little holes in the in the bone with, with the burr. The reason we do that, those are called cortical perforations. We do that because we're trying to create an acute wound. Remember, acute wounds heal a lot better than chronic wounds. So once you get to this point, and we're going to walk you through four more cases. So don't, if you have questions, don't worry about it. Three key concepts here. We have to do 
either barrier by bulk, guided bone regeneration, or a combination of both. You're going to do option three here. You're going to do a combination of both. But first of all, what is barrier by bulk? Bulk Barrier by bulk means you're going to put in bone graft material into the socket, which we're also going to put it around the socket, so on the facial aspect of it. Not because it's going to grow bone way out there, but because you need that, you're trying to create more space and distance between the flap or soft tissue and the bony defect where you're going to put your implant. So it's going to serve as a physical barrier, okay, just by creating more distance between the soft tissue and the defect. Um, this is mineralized cortical bone. And we're going to hydrate that in 20, for 20 minutes, and then we're going to pack it into the socket and around the socket. And then on top of that, we're going to put a memlock resorbable membrane. So this goes away in about four to, in an, on an average of about four months. Okay, sometimes they'll say six months, but I would say it, it probably goes away in about four months. Then you're going to get primary closure over the socket, and you'll notice at two weeks, the papilla are still preserved because we had that papilla sparing incision design so that we didn't destroy the papilla. Okay. This is what it looks like from the uh, occlusal aspect. Uh, radiographically, it always looks good because it's a two-dimensional picture. So we're going to take a CT at three at six months. So this is with our CBCT. You'll notice that we preserved and, and grew that bone uh, the way we wanted to, meaning if you look at the facial plate, it's a straight wall. It doesn't cave in. It, so it healed up perfectly, even though there was no facial wall. Now, why doesn't it bulk out? Because remember, we didn't do we didn't do the barrier by bulk with the intention of growing bone out there. Uh, we did it for the intention of with the purpose of creating distance between the flap and the defect. So this to me is an acceptable you know, bone grafting result. We're going to show you some better ones uh, later on. So what about more blown out facial plates? So this is a case that I'll often show for soft tissue management because this this uh, young lady came in with missing, uh, congenitally missing number seven and number 10. The problem is, is if you look above number eight, you'll see a little draining uh, fistula there or fistulous tract. And when you look at the periapical film, you'll see a radiolucency around uh, number eight. So in a situation like that, you take a CBCT and there's your blown out facial plate. So at this point, we have, we have a treatment planning situation, right? She's congenitally missing seven and 10. And now number eight is hopeless after we, we consider endo first. So I want to show you what we did for the sake of time. So what we did is we went ahead, since she's already missing seven and 10, we just added another tooth to, to her uh, flipper. But as far as managing number eight, you're going to notice we have a papilla sparing flap design, sparing the papilla between eight and nine. We've got a full thickness flap. You can see the big blown out facial plate, but we're going to keep that little thin piece of bone at the crestal margin there. We're going to add our, our mineralized cortical bone into the socket and around the socket like you can see here. And then we're gonna cover it with a resorbable membrane and get primary closure over that defect. Now, you're going to have a lesson here uh, in soft tissue management now. What happens when you get primary closure over that socket? You're going to pull that mucogingival junction, you know, coronally or incisally, and now you're going to have a mucogingival defect, right? So this is what it looks like when it's healed. So now our job is, is when we play, place our implants, we have to know to make our crestal incision more to the lingual so that we can preserve more keratinized gingiva and then push that tissue towards the facial aspect a little bit more. This is what it looks like uh, on the CBCT. This is our bone graft. Very nice, big, robust ridge. Really love that uh, before and after for, for our uh, ridge augmentation there or our GBR procedure. This is what it looks like uh, just on a different, different view, uh, vantage point. Our surgical reentry, you can see, see what that looks like. You have a lot of bone, very good width. So what about our implant placement? So we're going to place an implant for number eight and number 10. So we're not going to, we're going to skip number seven because we're going to skip number seven because if we don't do that, we, we may not end up with a good papilla between the two, between two implants. And I'll show you a chart on that here in a second. Well, look at where the crestal incision is. It's off to the lingual, pushing all the keratinized tissue to the facial. 
That way, when we put our healing abutments on, you can see how much keratinized tissue we have. Almost looks like we, we, we've done a soft tissue draft, even though we didn't. So if you look at this chart, if you look at number six, class six there, between two implants, so if you put implants side by side, the average papilla height is only three and a half millimeters. But if we do an implant next to a pontic, the average height of the papilla is five and a half millimeters. So you can gain two millimeters just by prosthesis design. So this is what you're going to see here. Okay. Have pretty good matchup of the papilla all the way across, utilizing a, a crown for number eight, cantilevered over to number seven. Here's your before, and here's your after. Now, what about severely blown out facial and lingual plate here? So you're going to look at this case here. We have a huge periapical radiolucency, no bone, facial, or lingual. So it's just basically floating there uh, with just a little bit of bone holding it in around, around the crest, which has turned out to be a really good thing, and I'll show you why. So when we do our papilla sparing flat design all the way past the apex of the of the defect, we have to get all the way around the defect. You'll notice that uh, we have a pretty big defect on the facial as well as the lingual. The bone graft is going to go into the socket as well as on the outside of the socket. That's called barrier by bulk. We're going to put a membrane on it. Now this membrane is poorly trimmed. You don't want your membrane sticking out over the over the flat design or flat edges here. So we got to trim that back, and that's what it looks like. Now, how do you secure this membrane? That's going to be the bonus that I'm going to give you here in about 10 minutes. We're going to coronally advance that tissue and suture together, and at two weeks, you're going to notice we've got a lot of soft tissue, a lot of papilla, okay? That's exactly what you want. So when we do our CBCT here, at six months, you can see how much buccal you know, bone augmentation we were able to get. If you guys are paying attention, you'll notice that we have a concavity on the lingual. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you, I forgot to put a membrane on the lingual side. And because of that, we got some infiltration of the bone into the defect because remember, there's no membrane. The purpose of the membrane is to exclude the epithelium, right? So we didn't exclude the epithelium, so it grew into the defect. Fortunately, we were able to grow a bunch of the bone on the facial aspect so that we could still place our implant and, and restore the tooth like you see here. So sometimes you get lucky, but at any rate, it's, it, I love this case because it definitely shows you in the same mouth, in the same tooth, you know, the importance of using a membrane. Real quick quiz time. So what would you do in this situation? If you have missing number 29 and number 30, um, both teeth are hopeless. Flaps open, teeth are out. I'm going to tell you, you have a facial and a lingual plate. You have good interproximal bone. What graft material would you use? Do you use a membrane? Do you have to get primary closure? And how long do you wait before placing the implant? These are questions that we talked about in the first webinar. So if you guessed mineralized cortical bone for your graft material, great. You absolutely do not have to use a membrane. And the reason that is, is because you have a facial and a lingual uh, plate and you have interproximal bone. Because you don't need a membrane, you also don't need primary closure. And because you don't need a membrane or need primary closure and you have four intact walls of bone, you only have to wait eight to 12 weeks before you place the implant. Most doctors will say 12 weeks. So 12 weeks is a safe bet before you place the implant. So here we are with the bone graft material. There we are with no membrane and no primary closure. And we're going to come back in in three months and there's your bone. Okay, so that's how you would manage a basic socket graft with four intact walls of bone. What about this one? Clinically, you already see a fistulous tract at the apex of tooth number seven. Number seven and eight are hopeless. Okay, number eight's got a horizontal root fracture. Number seven's got something going on with the, with the periapical lesion there. Um, so we take out the teeth and this is what you see. You have full blown out facial plates. What graft material you use? Do you use a membrane? Do you, use, do you need primary closure? And how long do you wait before placing the implant? So the same questions, but there, it's a different scenario because you don't have a labial plate. So once again, you're still going to use mineralized cortical bone. You can, we can talk about in our other courses, you know, what, what else you could add to it. 
but you absolutely need a membrane. When you don't have a facial plate, you're going to need a membrane. And I would suggest that you get primary closure. And I would also suggest that we wait. And if you're not used to doing this stuff, I would wait six months before you place the implant. So here's our primary closure. Six months, there's the bone. So we've got plenty of bone to place our implants in a well-positioned manner. You look at all the, all the bone on the facial aspect. So the primary closure is the key to dealing with bone out buccal plates and, and ridge augmentations. So I'm going to do one last thing about with the ridge augmentations, and then we're going to show you how to suture in that membrane, because that's the one thing I think you know people see on the internet and they really can't visualize how that's done. So if you have a, a, a buccal, uh, buccal ridge atrophy of, of an edentulous site here, number 19, 20 area, this is what it looks like, very uh, atrophic mandible right here. So the first thing you've got to do is cortical perforations or intramural penetration, whatever you want to call it. Okay, you're going to use a round diamond bird. You're just going to poke holes into the bone until you get leading points. That's that acute wound that you get. Then here I've used a tenting screw to uh, give us more stability and space maintenance. That's mineralized cortical bone around it. We're going to use two membranes. I could have used one big membrane, but I didn't have one big membrane, so I used two small ones. And then we're going to close that up, pull all that mucosa, you know, over, over to the lingual, which is what happens when you get primary closure. So what that means is before you get your final restorations done, you have got to make that crestal incision over to the lingual to push all that keratinized tissue over to the facial when you uncover these implants. Okay. That's why in the final result here, you'll notice that we have that fairly adequate two millimeters of keratinized tissue on the facial of, of that 1920 area or 1819 area, whatever you want to call it. So with our last seven or eight minutes or so, how do you stabilize the membrane? Okay. If you guys have tried this before without stabilizing the membrane, you may have experienced your bone flowing everywhere. Your membrane's floating on top. It's kind of going in and out of the flap. You're trying to hold it down. Your assistant's trying to hold it down. It can be kind of a mess, right? And then before you know it, you have like no bone in the defect. So this is just a, a little video on, on how I do it. So when we're grafting, this is, uh, we're grafting site number seven here. And then uh, the, the key thing here is you want to account for resorption of the bone. So you're going to add way more bone than you need. Remember, Barrier by bulk. And a lot of people can't visualize that in slides. So I, I shot some video. So this is how much bone I'm adding. So it's a, it's a lot. You know, that's, that's what you want. Um, the membrane has been trimmed here. So it has to cover the whole, all the graft material. All right. We'll clean it up a little bit. But for the most part, we'll put the graft in, uh, in first. And then I'll put the membrane over the top of that. You'll have to experiment with yourself on, on how how it works best in your hands. But for the most part, I do bone graft first and then the membrane over the top. You'll notice I tuck one edge of the membrane in on the, the lingual flap first. And then with my suture, this is um, this is 5-O-glycolon suture, by the way. The, the thing that I do is I will uh, go through the lingual flap first. So the lingual side of the lingual flap is what you just saw. The next thing I'll do is I'll grab uh, the periosteum, and that's the periosteum. I think this is probably the best uh, that I best shot of the periosteum that I could get. But anyway, that's the periosteum, that, that the apical portion of it right there. And we're going to pass the needle, you know, through the through the periosteum and grab it here. And keep in mind where you're at. I mean, you're right underneath the nose, so that's why uh, whenever patients are healing, they, their lip swells up like crazy. So now we've gone through the lingual side of the palatal flap. We've gone through the periosteum. Now we're over the membrane. And then we're going to come back through the facial side of the lingual flap. That's what we're doing here. Then we're just going to grab that needle. And then you'll just kind of pull it through. Now, the purpose of this first uh, periosteal uh, anchoring suture is to, is to get it on the mesial side of that of that. Uh, of the of the membrane there, so we'll just tie it tie it on the onto the lingual. Warn the patient that hey, 
you know, you have a knot back there, it's going to be super annoying to you, but it's really important that it's there. That way, you know, we can secure your bone graft in your membrane. So we'll tie the knot onto the lingual. And you don't want to pull it too tight because you don't want to like put a, you know, uh, put a bit, a big wrinkle in your, in your membrane. So just pull it just nice and snug. Like you see here, it's also important that you choose a membrane that's semi-rigid like Memlock. That way it doesn't tear on you or, or fold and collapse. Okay. Sometimes people get into like the amnion membranes and stuff like that. Those are great membranes for certain situations, but those are really hard to tie in because they're so paper thin. Some people call it rice paper that it'll, it'll fold up on itself. So you don't want that. So we'll tie that knot on the, on the lingual side. Once again, let the patients know it's going to be kind of annoying. And then we'll do another one for the, for the distal aspects. The first one went to the, towards the mesial. This one's going to go towards the distal. So once again, you'll go through the lingual side of the lingual flap. And you'll also want to, you know, pull it almost all the way through and, and leave yourself a, a, a tail of about, you know, an inch to two long. You don't want to, you want to do that now because you don't want to start pulling all this suture through uh, while you're trying to secure your membrane. You might, you might start moving things around. So here, uh, we don't get as good a, a shot of, of the uh, periosteum as the last suture, but you can still see we're, we're right through that periosteum. So this is the soft tissue at the very, very base of the flap, okay? And space does get kind of tight. You can kind of see where the membrane wanted to, wanted to tent up a little bit, and that's okay, because once I grab that periosteum, then, then I'm back in control here. So we'll just uh, use a needle holder, use some tissue pickups, whatever you want to do, and just basically get that suture right back over the top of that, that distal edge or uh, distal margin of that membrane. And then you'll come back through the facial side of the lingual uh, flap. So this will be technically a, a mattress type, type suture. Horizontal mattress, I guess you could call, call that. Um, but anyway, you'll grab the needle and then you'll tie the knot onto the lingual again. As far as sutures go, the other type of suture too, uh, glycolon is also, there's a couple different names for it. There's a, sometimes we call it PGA suture. So that's the generic term for it. It's a slowly resorbable type membrane. So you don't have to go back in and take this out or anything like that. Uh, the other thing that I use a lot of too is just chromic gut. You know, so anything resorbable, since it's going to go underneath the flap, those things work really, really well. So that's really uh, how you secure the membrane. So in this situation, because it's just a single tooth, you know, sometimes I'll do one to two uh, of these of these periosteal anchoring sutures, and this is what it looks like uh, when we're done. Okay. So here, the, the idea is that you can kind of move the lip up and down, move the flap around, and that tissue and, and the bone and everything should, uh, I'm sorry, the, the membrane and the bone should stay very, very stable, okay? Should not have a lot of blood or a lot of things flowing around. At this point, I would, I would say we're pretty much done with securing the membrane and, and the bone. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for tonight's great presentation. If anyone has any outstanding questions, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording via email in the next week. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you again, Dr. Wong.